Thank y'all so much for um, joining us today and allowing me to talk to y'all about <clears throat> some work that I'm very passionate about and have been working on since uh, 2014. So um, again, my name is Kristen Bale with American Bird Conservancy and we'll be talking about beach nesting birds today along the Texas Gulf Coast. So just to quickly give you an overview, I'll talk about our program and why it was started. I'll then go into some of the population status and nesting ecology of beach nesting birds, some of their threats and challenges, and our conservation efforts to address these threats. Starting with our program, our Texas, <clears throat> excuse me, Texas Shorebird and Seabird Stewardship Program. It was um, um, established right after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill as a response. Um, the Gulf birds, you know, were in need of help, and so American Bird Conservancy um, started this program to partner with other organizations along the coast to help stabilize um, and hopefully increase populations of imperiled beach nesting bird species through protection, monitoring, and outreach. I'll go over each one of these prongs throughout our presentation, but quickly I'll kind of go over them real quick. Uh, our protection efforts are putting up these yellow signs that you see here um, around the nesting areas. And then we'll actually fence off some of the, um, those nesting areas as well with some baler twine and flagging tape. Um, you see some beach goers here reading our signs. All of our signs are in yellow and we, try to co we coordinated this with um, the nesting signs on the Rookery Islands. We monitor the birds that are um, nesting in those beach nesting bird areas. And we also monitor the response to the protections um, signs that we put up. So we monitor the number of uh, breeding pairs and what species. We monitor their nest fates for only the plovers. So we'll monitor the nest, see if they hatch. And if they don't hatch, we try to figure out why. Um, and then we try to determine how many fledges um, are produced each year. Not all sites we can do this. But and then we also look to um, see what kind of disturbances these birds you know, may encounter. If there's any kind of human disturbances, we try to work with land managers, <clears throat> landowners, and try to um, help address those issues. And lastly, we do outreach. There's a lot of people <clears throat> that go to the beach that do not know that birds lay their eggs in the sand. So this has <clears throat> been a really huge part of our pro uh, program. It's just uh, making the, the public more aware. We'll go um, on site on weekends, busy weekends and holidays at some of our busy beaches. We'll talk to the public then. We'll go to outreach events. We'll talk to schools. You name it. We try to get the word out however possible. So, um, as I mentioned, this is a partnership program. We do work with other partners outside of Texas, but I'm just going to talk to you about our Texas work. And on this map are some of the sites that our partners work at. And our, our main partners that, are, that help us with the monitoring and protection efforts are Houston Audubon, Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And these are not all the partners that we work with. And, um, we have so many great ones, but these are the ones that help us with some of the field work and such. And so, um, so I am based out of the Upper Texas Coast. Um, Galveston is kind of where I distribute from. And I... My region it starts, you know, from Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge, East Beach to San Luis Pass. So that's my area of, of, of my field. And so um, just out of default, a lot of my examples that I'm going to be given today are stuff that I've seen in the field. There's a lot of the work that I've been associated with. And there's also a lot of, you know, human disturbances or much more humans up on the extra upper Texas coast that we, we um, deal with. But um, there's a lot of um, great work that is being done, you know, all, all across the coast. And... Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, a lot of their work starts around Dow Chemical Freeport area, all the way to Colorado River Mouth Flats, and then Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program, they're based in the Corpus region, so a lot of their sites that we partner with, it starts around Port Aransas Nature Preserve all the way down to Boca Chica. So our partners are kind of based um, around, you know, where their office is at and where they can distribute from, and so we will, we do monitor um, different sites at different years, so these are not all our sites that we monitor every single year, but sometimes they are. Um, and sometimes we pick up sites, sometimes we drop them to based, on, based on funding or maybe, um, you know, one raise or another. So this just kind of gives you an idea of where we're distributed across the coast. Our target beach nesting bird species are snowy plovers, Wilson's plovers, least terns, and black skimmers. And these are our target species because they all have lower declining populations. And every single one of these species are on um, 
fixed park and wildlife um, species of greatest con conservation need. Um, snowy plovers and black skimmers are um, birds of conservation concern. They're either on, you know, uh, one um, conservation status or another. So um, I've listed some of their population statuses and we try to pull data from some the uh, reports that we can find. But um, overall, you know, snowy plovers, 71% of snowy plovers uh, are nesting in uh, coastal Texas. So uh, our the Texas coast is important for snowy plovers, as well as 31% of all Wilson's plovers are in Texas. Black skimmers are in some trouble. They their populations have declined 70% over the last 50 years. And so um, least terns, the ones that nest on the coast are not part of the endangered or the threatened population, and which the least terns are now get the interior populations are getting delisted, but um, their their populations are separate, but they still have um, some issues as well. So, um, you know, we we work with these species because their populations are struggling. There's a lot of threats or, uh, you know, associated with them. So we want to help them out. So just uh, to let you know their nesting season in general, I like to tell everybody their nesting season is from spring break to Labor Day approximately. And so that's pretty much the entire recreational season for people. Um, the, the birds don't stick to these dates, of course, snowy, these birds are listed in order of when they start nesting. So snowy plovers are the first ones to start nesting in early March, but in the lower coast, they start nesting in February. There was one record of, uh, late January, a uh, snowy plover laid a full clutch. Wilson's plovers will start laying their eggs early April, followed by least turns in early May and then black skimmers and, um, in May as well. And then black skimmers are the last ones for their chicks to fledge. Um, and so sometimes it's, you know, mid September by the time the last chicks will fledge. So, um, it, you know, for, it takes about 21 to 24 days for their eggs to hatch. And, uh, for least turns, it takes them approximately 20 days to fledge and the rest of the birds around 30 days. So, um, so it takes a while for these birds to, to at least just get their eggs to hatch and fledging on top of that. So. Um, some of these birds have a narrow, it's a relatively narrow window that they, um, they nest. So, um, they have, they just try to pump out as many eggs as possible and they work really hard at it. So for those of you going to the beach, just know that between spring break and labor day, there's, there may be some birds nesting on the beach. So just the habitat that they like is open sandy areas. They like sparse vegetation and, um, just <laughs> wide open spaces. So when I see this. You know, just some person, they, they would think that there's nothing living there. It's kind of just barren land, but the way I look at it, this is just prime real estate for beach nesting birds. And so uh, I want people to kind of look at these habitats in a new light. So um, so just wanted to kind of show you, you know, um, what they like. On the upper Texas coast, the habitat for the beach nesting birds, it changes throughout the coast. So on the upper Texas coast, we have a lot of beachfront um, habitat that the birds will actually use. Um, on the right is Bolivar Flat Shorebird Sanctuary. Um, they, there, there's a lot of dunes that have developed there. And then on the left is East Beach and Galveston. This is a mix of beach and back beach habitat. Again, sparse sandy areas. Um, as you move further down the coast, the beach, some of the beaches are, can be quite eroded and some of them can be kind of, uh, um, wide enough to support some nesting birds. So there's a mix, but as you further go further down the coast, um, it's mostly bayside flats, sand flats that these birds are using. And these all have been photos of uh, some of our, our monitoring sites. So on the left is Port Aransas Nature Preserve, and the right is Packery Flats Habitat Community, uh, which is on Mustang Island. So again, just uh, sparse, um, you know, low lying areas really. And then uh, this is all at Boca Chica on the beach versus the sand flats. So those sand flats on the right is a, their prime nesting habitat. So Again, I'm, I'm going to keep showing you some visuals of their habitat. So, so everyone knows and can kind of understand how vulnerable these birds are on the beach. So, um, each 1 of these species kind of has a different preference of nesting habitat. Snowy plovers. They like. Again, they like uh, very sandy areas with just a little bit of vegetation to kind of hide around. And if you look, as I go through these photos, just notice how camouflaged the eggs and the chicks are. This is a great ad adaptation to hide from predators. But um, think of it as a beach goer perspective. It's they're very camouflaged. Wilson's plovers, they do like a little bit more vegetation to hide in. 
<clears throat> they're a little bit darker in color, so I think they can camouflage a little bit more in that vegetation. The bottom right photo is a chick that's maybe about two weeks old or so. These terns, <laughs> they'll just plop their eggs right in the open sand with no vegetation whatsoever. They just, they will nest quick and fast, and a lot of times it's just in open sand. And black skimmers, um, the majority of them nest in bayside islands in, on the Texas coast, but in um, there's some cases where they do nest uh, on the mainland. So this is a, the left photos at Dow Chemical in Freeport. The uh, Gulf Coast Bird Observatory is monitoring these. And it's a small, I think, like three acre little plot. They, it's a, they nest in the parking lot of Dow Chemical, but Dow Chemical is wonderful. And they put up a uh, electric fencing around the nesting area to keep predators out. And this is one of the um, best, you know, nesting areas for black skimmers on the coast. Occasionally, they will move to the beach whenever um, they fail in their bayside habitats. And so we've had them um, nesting in our protected areas on the beach. So I just want to play a game with you. This is um, a kind of a game that I do with people um, at my outreach events to help them really see, um, show them how um, camouflage these birds are on the beach. So I'm going to play, uh, I'm just going to throw some photos out with you and I'm going to ask you um, um, to find, you know, whatever is in the picture and then I'll um, wait a few seconds and show you the answer. So can you find the Wilson's plover incubating its nest? This is at Bolivar Flat Shorebird Sanctuary on their beachfront. It is right there, so it just blends right in with all the the sargasm and the um, the natural debris that washes the shore on the, in the high tides. They use that as their nesting material, right in front of the dunes. Can you find the least turn nest? There you go. There's. Two eggs and then one chick is just hatched on the left. Again, this is on the beach front, nesting in the material that the tide is washed in. This is actually right in front of the dunes too. Can you find the least turn nest? Right in the middle of the photo, so maybe not too hard, but um, they it, it blends in completely. So if you're a beach goer walking on the beach, this is again a beach front. Um, site um, is very easy to miss if you were a beachgoer. And the last one, how many least turn chicks do you see? Two. <laughs> so these chicks have hatched in um, the sand flats um, and they again, they, they blend in perfectly with that environment. So incredibly <laughs> camouflage and vulnerable. So, so uh, the threats and challenges for these birds, I'm gonna start with the natural predators. There are a lot of avian species, Crested Caracaras, top left photo. They will literally just walk the dunes looking for eggs and chicks. Happens all the time at one of my sites. They have a nest, excuse me, nearby um, that they nest at and they just eat lunch every day in the nesting habitat. Yellow crowned night herons on the top right. Bottom left is grackles. Those, those are getting um, worse, I'm noticing. They grackles do love to, um, they do great around people. They like to eat out of the trash cans and when they don't eat out of the trash cans, then they move to the nesting area. So I've, we've noticing a lot more um, eggs that just disappear and we can't confirm that the grackles, but we're um, pretty sure that they're grackles. They, we see a lot of eggs that have puncture wounds in them. Um, and so we assume there's some grackles and laughing gulls are a big threat as well. They will take the eggs and chicks. So these, and the bottom right photo is two snowy plovers that are chasing off a laughing gull that was trying to eat their chick. Ghost crabs are a huge threat. Uh, there's a bird, at least turn incubating its nest on the left. And on the right is its mate trying to defend it um, against the, the, the ghost crab in the middle. Unfortunately, this nest did not survive this ghost crab attempt. You can see the ghost crab hole in the front. So um, they're big predators. And Another major uh, threat are coyotes. Coyotes are everywhere across the coast. They are a threat no matter what, pretty much everywhere. And feral hogs are starting to take, kind of take hold in, in south um, in the central coast. And this is a photo on the right of um, some feral hogs that were trapped at Port Aransas Nature Preserve. We were our monitoring efforts show that some of the a lot of the nests were getting depredated by these hogs. And so we address this with the managers there, and they proactively trap um, the hogs. So um, 
it's it's always a continue um, continued work. Rain is a threat. The temperatures, you know, from the soaking rain, the water will sit there and, and change the temperature in the eggs, and they'll become duds. High tides are huge. This is a before and after photo at Packery Flats on Mustang Island. Um, you know, we usually get a, at least one major high tide event in early spring. It's usually right when the first round of nests are hatching, unfortunately. And uh, every, you know, storm event afterwards, you know, tides can be a threat as well. And uh, tropical storms and hurricanes, of course, are going to be an issue. This is both of these photos are from Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge on the upper Texas coast. Um, their property does reach the Gulf Beach. And so um, it's a very narrow beach, but each storm is just um, makes it worse and worse. Last year, the photo on the right shows how we had three tropical storms completely just erode the beach. And now the beach meets the road and vehicles constantly drive from directly off into the nesting habitat. So that's a, been a new threat. So vehicles, as I just mentioned, are just constant. A lot of people don't see the, the dune habitat as nesting habitat. It's um, even though people are not supposed to be in the dunes, it's always an issue. The photo on the left shows a least turn nest that dodged these, um, these tire tracks, but within a few days, this nest did get crushed. This is at San Louis Pass on the Galveston side. Um, so major threat all the time. Again, here's another photo of Anahuac Beach. Least turns are nesting. They love just the open and this nest did not survive um, after a few days. So just constant threats for these birds. Pedestrians can be, you know, threats is, again. They're walking on the beach, don't realize it. So we've had some close calls. We also have lost some nests to some pedestrians. One little chick got crushed, from, you know, from what I've seen and as well as others across the Gulf. So um, it's a threat. So I'm just going to kind of blaze through some more. Unleashed dogs running through nesting habitat. Feeding gulls. Gulls um, love people. They love to eat. And once you stop feeding them, they're, you know, will move over to the nesting area and pick up some more snacks from them, like eggs or chicks along the way. Camping, you know, um, again, photographers can be a threat. Um, here, there's little white specks in the air. Those are least turns off their nest because this photographer was up close to the fencing. It, the photographer was outside the fencing, but we're only allowed to fence so much because of Texas Open Beaches Act. We cannot close the beach. So we have to keep some of the beach open for the public. And so those signs and fencing that we put up do not protect every bird, even though you're outside of it, there's, you know, they'll still get disturbed. And so constant, you know, education there. And this uh, helicopters are a threat. Here's a helicopter doing some practice landings in Porter uh, Ranzas Nature Preserve. Fortunately, our staff, you know, team was out there monitoring, saw this happening, contacted the helicopter pilot and saw, and, you know, they stopped practicing there. And this nature preserve is a landing pad. This was actually happening a lot. And so fortunately we were able to finally catch them. Another threat that I'm just gonna briefly talk about is, because this is a big issue, a bigger issue than today's conversation, but SpaceX down in Boca Chica is um, become, is a, is a growing threat. Um, their launch facility was built in a really beautiful, pristine habitat for nesting birds. And so, um, these are some outdated photos or operations have grown even more. And so um, they have fires, explosions constantly. The snowy plover here in the ye yellow box is nesting right next to it. So um, with increasing test launches, this is going to you know just continue to be increasing threat. And trash. So trash is um, you know everywhere. There was the bottom right photo shows a least turned nest. It laid its egg in this plastic bag. So I just um, you know, I don't want to go too deep into our monitoring results because there's a lot of it, but I wanted to show you how, um, you know, what we do monitor. So this, an example is for Wilson's Clover nest fates between 2014 and 2019. We're still monitoring nest fates, but this is the data that I want to show you today. We record if it's hatched or depredated or washed out, abandoned. Was it a human caused failure? So all of these um, will show you the fate and then just draw your attention to the very bottom apparent nest success. So what was the percentage of nests that actually hatched out of the total number of nests? So you can see there's the percentage of nest, this is that hatched across all of our sites. These are uh, accumulation of all of our sites between these years. 
And so the, the numbers vary dramatically. Um, we stay floating around 30% is kind of about normal, which is kind of unfortunate, but because there's so many threats these birds, you know, deal with. Um, but every, every now and then we might get a good year, like in 2018, 59% of the nests of all Wilson's plover nest hatched. So not bad, but 2015 was not a good year. Only 18% of nest hatched um, across all of our sites. And again, our sites varied. Um, so we had more sites we monitored versus, you know, versus other years, but this kind of gives you an idea of kind of what these um, float around. So I, I took those apparent nest success from all the Texas coast, the top table, and then I separated it out between two different sites across our coastline, just to kind of see, show you how they kind of fluctuate at each each site. So the middle table shows you results of Wilson's Plover nest fates at East Beach in Galveston. East Beach is a is a very large beach. People pay to enter. The the top right photo shows you the parking area. It could potentially fit up to 7,000 vehicles, but really probably around 5,000. But this just shows you it's a very large beach and to the right of that parking area is where the birds nest. So there's kind of a fine line between nesting and recreational areas. And then the bottom table is Port Aransas Nature Preserve. And it's, this is a, in Port Aransas, it's a beautiful nature preserve. It's, there is some recreation, but it's not, not like the East Beach one. It's a very small parking lot and not all of it's, of the preserve people can access. So it's just, you know, for the most part, pretty pristine. But um, if you look at the nest success between the years, between the sites, um, Port Aransas Nature Preserve, their nest success is a lot lower than East Beach and Galveston. And there's a lot of different issues there. Um, but for the most part, to kind of summarize it, Port Aransas Nature Preserve has a lot of predators that they deal with. And so that really impacts um, nest being able to hatch. East Beach, there's a lot of people and angles and such, but uh, but yet somehow um, with our protection, you know, measures that we put in there, a lot of the people stay out. So, um, but so it's important to have all the you know multiple sites across the coast for these birds to use to really help bring up those um, numbers. And I just wanted to touch on 2018. This was the year after Hurricane Harvey hit our coastline. And the numbers did increase for all the sites there. Um, and um, hurricanes can actually be pretty beneficial for nest, beach nesting birds. It actually blows out a lot of dense vegetation and actually creates new open sandy areas for these birds. So I um, just wanted to kind of focus in again on Puerto Ranzas Nature Preserve. Um, they, uh, you know, 13%, 13 nests hatched when a five-year average is only three nests hatching. So Port Aransas Nature Preserve after Hurricane Harvey, there was less predators. I think this, the hurricane actually took out a lot of the coyotes and hogs. So there was one good year of the birds nesting with fewer predators. So that was beneficial for the birds. But um, in kind of contrast, um, Bolivar Flats and Sh Shorebird Sanctuary in Galveston area. Um, this is the aerial photo from after Hurricane Ike hit in 2008. And you can see this new sandy area that these, the hurricane created. So it, it created this new open sandy area. And, you know, again, prime real estate for beach nesting birds. But through the years, vegetation grows in. And this is the bottom right photo is from 2018. And the vegetation, again, you know, it's, it's, it's forming in. There's less beach nesting bird habitat within the sanctuary. So a lot of the birds have been moving to the beach. But this is a natural progression. And... Again, why it's important for the birds to have multiple sites. Uh, from our monitoring efforts, we were able to see that the birds that were nesting at Bolivar Flat Shorebird Sanctuary moved to East Beach. Once that that vegetation, I think the habitat was starting to change a little bit, they moved to East Beach. Uh, our, our numbers um, show that we we banned the birds, and through resite information, we were able to confirm that they just hopped over the Houston Ship Channel and move over to East Beach. Um, in the meantime, and so they'll move back and forth between um, the sites, uh, depending on each year, what the vegetation's like, threats, predators. So um, let's focus in on our conservation efforts now that you're kind of familiar with our threats. Um, again, we put up these yellow signs and fencing around the areas and some um, as simple as this is, it's a baler's twine, <laughs> flagging tape, wooden posts, very temporary. People can easily go underneath it. But 
this has shown to be so effective. Um, one, you're educating the, the public. Again, a lot of people don't know the birds are nesting there, but now we're we're informing them that they're nesting there, and um, and you you have to maintain the signs. Some people will cut them. Some people will trespass. You you talk to the public. You keep up with the signs. Persistence plays off through the years. Each site, there's always less and less disturbance. So it's something as simple as putting up these signs is really effective. There's some black scammers nesting behind um, those yellow signs, and um, it's just incredible how well it works. Um, and then depending on um, the, the layout of the site and, per, and with permission from the landowner, we can also put up these other signs and the top left, top right says, help keep our beach nesting birds safe. Please walk in the wet sand and watch for flightless chicks proceed with extreme caution. And as I mentioned, we're not able to fence off the entire beach. All beaches are open to the public and we, we keep them that way. We don't fence them all off. And so there's good chunks of the beach that are not protected with the fencing. And so we use these signs to help guide people away from the nesting area. And here's another example of how well the, the fencing works. So again, East Beach is that really high use area. Um, this is a, a, a corridor that gets you to the beach from the parking area. And to the left of the picture, you can see all the footprints are outside the fencing and uh, everybody's you know, obeying this, um, the signs and fencing. So really effective. Uh, here's another example of how effective this is, San Luis Pass County Park in Freeport. These little, about two weeks old-ish Wilson's Plover chicks are just um, just eating away with um, less, no cares. They're not threatened and they're able to just be cute little chicks running on the beach with these protection measures. And San Luis Pass in Galveston, these dunes constantly are um, being used by ATVs and Jeeps and whatnot, people love to drive through these dunes and it's really unfortunate, but there's, um, uh, once we started putting up these signs, we don't put up fencing, it's too dangerous to put up fencing, but once we started putting up these signs, um, within one year, a lot of the vegetation has grown in. This is uh, one of those vehicle paths and just one sign alone right there helped close that area almost entirely. We saw a brood of willet chicks using that area, it was beautiful. And so not, not everybody stops or, you know, obeys, but you get, you know, a lot of people will read and respect the signs and it's, it's amazing. Hackery Flats, again, on, on Mustang Island, we um, install some signs and fencing and um, keep your dog on a leash sign. And this was in 2008, we did this. A lot of fishermen will, will walk through the nesting area to get to their fishing area in the bay. And so, um, so we noticed this and we said we put up some fencing as well as this sign on the right, uh, it's fishing access this way. So we wanna direct people to the right way. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize where to go. So we're gonna help direct them and that helped reduce disturbances completely um, or uh, significantly, excuse me. And um, and that year that we put this up in 2018, all Wilson's Plover uh, nest hatched that year. And, you know, weather help, you know, is a factor in that and um, less predators because it was after Harvey, but we know the fencing work from anecdotal, you know, sites. So it's again, effective. Um, one major win that we had this year is out at East Beach in Galveston. Um, Galveston Island Park Board of Trustees manages all beaches in Galveston. And this, um, they have, as I mentioned, there's 7,000 vehicles could potentially fit in this parking lot. The photo on the left shows you a concert venue being set up. And then behind that concert venue is the, is the nesting area. And so there's there's some conflict there, and a lot of these events are happening in the summer um, when people are out. So to help address this disturbance and help um, work in the middle between large events and, and nesting birds, the Galveston Park Board of Trustees asked us to put together this best management practices for large events. And so it was voted on and approved that uh, for the park board to follow these recommendations, so they don't have to do all these, but it is um, they, the park board is is sticking with a lot of these conservation measures to help protect the nesting birds. We highlight, you know, when is basically um, uh, the worst time to have a large event. Um, we recommended putting buffers uh, uh, around the venue and um, measures to reduce trash and reduce noise. So we um, the park board this. This document came live in 2000, this year, 2021, and it helped start 
stop a large kite festival that was happening that was going to happen in June, peak nesting season. So imagine large kites, which birds do get threatened by, they seem as predators. So that, that could have been very disturbing for the birds, but this document helped stop that event. And we don't want to stop all events. We're not again, we're not for that, but we want to mitigate and reduce the greatest uh, amounts of disturbance. And another a win, you know, in uh, working with the land managers, there used to be a pedestrian trail through the nesting area. The red line shows you where our fencing is. And so that people could in 2014 up until last year, they could walk all around the fencing area. And um, with our, the increase of vegetation, um, there was a lot more birds nesting inside and outside the fencing. So we asked the park board if we could um, close that pedestrian trail and they approved it this year so that the birds had that entire site to themselves and it was just absolutely phenomenal. And we put up these signs, area closed, do not enter at those X's so that people don't enter. And we had very few people actually trespass. So again, we just need to stay on top of these things. We address each threat each year. Everything's, it'll change each year. So we try to work with them and against, uh, again, persistence is key. So, um, and so we'll pick up new sites occasionally if, if, if we can. Rollover Pass was just closed this past winter. So the photo on the left shows you an old aerial imagery. I, I don't have a new aerial imagery that shows you the closure, but the photo on the right shows you the Bayside closure. There's um, now sand completely. And so that's there's sparse vegetation in there that is prime real estate for the beach nesting birds. And um, Anahuac National, National Wildlife Refuge Beach is only two and a half miles away. Well, that beach was so eroded from all the storms last year, we, I believe that a lot of the birds moved here to roll over past to nest temporarily of uh, the season. So we had a short spurt of nesting birds here um, in the Galveston County allowed us to put up the signs temporarily. This area is gonna be developed into a park. So most likely um, the birds, you know, they'll be starting construction here soon. So this won't, this isn't a, you know, um, a site for the nesting birds, but it was a, it was kind of a pop-up nesting site this year. And so we were able to put up the signs there um, in the meantime, to help the birds. Um, so other birds, there are many other birds that will benefit from our protections, not just our four target nesting species, but there's a lot of birds that use this, the, the protected areas. Black neck stilts, willets, the middle photos of family of clapper rails, um, common nighthawk on the top right, killdeer and horn larks, and I think even some eastern meadow larks are starting to nest in some of these areas. So. This, you know, these protection measures benefit um, many more species. Um, I'm just gonna kind of briefly touch on you some, you know, our our conservation efforts to help in the Boca Chica area. Um, as I mentioned, SpaceX operations, they're a lot larger than they originally said that they were in the FFA's, FAA's 2014 environmental impact statement. They're doing a lot more the operations it has increased and, um, Coastal Bend Basin Estuaries Program just released this report that said that um, piping plover populations have declined 54% since SpaceX operations started in um, 2018. That was a report that was just published this uh, this fall. And so the, the yellow star on the right in that map shows you where SpaceX operations are, and the red polygon is the piping plover critical habitat. So SpaceX operations are, you know, right in the middle of everything, and uh, there's beach nesting birds as well that is that are using this area and um, coastal Boone Bays and estuaries program has um, has been doing some monitoring um, until they can't because SpaceX keeps closing the road. But anyways, American Bird Conservancy um, put together this action alert. We worked with a lot of stakeholders on this and partners to put this action alert together, asking for people to ask FAA to create a new environmental impact statement that um, includes this increase of facility operations out at Boca Chica. Um, there's just too many too many birds there that um, are, are being impacted by their efforts that are um, a lot larger than they originally um, were. So comments were, were due November 1st, so it, the close, it's closed already, but so these are some of the efforts that were Continue to work on with other partners on, on these efforts. And outreach, again, this is um, very important. So since our program started 
we've we've reached out um, and educated, talked to people over forty five thousand people. We've um, asked the help of nine thousand volunteers to help us um, be a, a nest site steward or help us with a cleanup event, and they contributed over uh, about eight thousand hours of time. So. Education and outreach is, is key here, and we try to um, incorporate that as much as possible. Excuse me. <laughs> and um, to help address the trash issue, our organization, ABC, has partnered with Gulf Coast Bird Observatory and Black Cat I GIS, and we created this program called Splash, Stopping Plastics and Litter Along Shorelines. And, um, and you can visit their website, splashtx.org. And um, you can, the program is based out of the Houston Galveston region. We're just trying to help um, reduce as much trash as possible through education and cleanups. And we do some, um, some actual monitoring and do some uh, transects to document, you know, what is the greatest um, bits of trash on the beach. And um, so we do a lot of cleanups and um, Splash does a lot of education with schools or trying to change people's behaviors, you know, pack it in, pack it out. So this is a wonderful new program that just um, came online last year. So check out their website if you're interested um, and would like to help with the cleanup. They have their cleanups listed on site and you can sign up for their newsletter. And lastly, I'm just gonna finish this off with ways that you can help. So everybody um, most likely will probably go to the beach one way or another. And this is a, this is applicable to all beaches, not just Texas. So here's some ways that you can help the birds. Um, one, recycle your fishing line. Um, either um, there's monofilament tubes uh, are spaced out across the coast for you to put your um, fishing line and pack it in, pack it out. So a lot of a lot of times there's trash cans on the beach, and the wind will often blow that out. Goals and grackles will pull out your trash out of there. So it's better just to take your trash home with you and don't feed the goals. <laughs> um, this is hard and when you have little kids, I know it's they would love to do that. But again, it's just attracts more predators to the nesting area. Keep pets leashed at all times and obey posted areas on beaches and islands. So this is um, a lot of you know people have kayaks or boats and those little small rookery islands um, in the bayside are very important for the as well. So keep, keep off of those posted areas. And if a bird is calling and screaming at you, die bombing you, pretending to have a broken wing, step away very carefully. There's a nest or chick nearby guarantee. So um, the best practice for you to do is to walk in the wet sand, walk as furthest away from the dunes as possible. And um, just remember to fish, swim and play from 50 yards away and um, share the message with everyone that you can. And with that, I will take any questions for everybody. If y'all need y'all any questions for me that aren't gonna be answered today, feel free to email me and I can help you out as much as I can. Thank you all. Great, thanks, Kristen. I will read some of these uh, questions to you. Um, uh, but first of all, um, I think that last slide was really good because I was going to ask you what's the number one thing we can do as beachgoers, and wow, you laid it out perfectly here. Yeah. And you know, people might say, "What about you know, my dog's my best friend?" Well, your dog unleashed is stepping on stuff, sniffing things out, and unknowingly crushing eggs just like we are. So yeah, keep keep the dogs leashed up. Um, so this is a great slide. Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me read some questions before I get to that. I, I, I thought of maybe you shorebird folks probably tell jokes while you're doing this. You know, you're putting up the fencing and you're saying, will it work or won't it? Do you do, you do that? I don't know. And, and then I saw the yellow string. I wonder if you should switch to red so you could tie some red knots. So. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, I'm glad everyone's muted so I don't have to hear the booing and, uh, <laughs> So let's get to the serious questions. Okay, so Patsy asked before you got to your SpaceX slide, and I think you covered it. Patsy asked, how are SpaceX activities near Boca Chica impacting nesting birds? And someone else asked in the chat, uh, is SpaceX supposed to clean up? So uh, I'll, I'll let you field that. Yeah, so they're, all their test launches are, you know, it's just loud noise. 
is an impact. And then when they blow up, then all that debris is going into those sand flats, huge chunks of it. And then SpaceX vehicles go in and get get the, all all of that stuff. And you know, um, the ruts in those sand flats last years sometimes if um, if they're deep enough. Um, and then there's a lot of vehicle traffic along the highway that's separates some of those sand flats. So sometimes before construction, a lot of the chicks, the, the snowy plovers would move their chicks across the highway very quickly. But now um, there's just so many more vehicles. There's a lot of um, bird and animal mortality from the increase of vehicles. I mean, hundreds, I think is what I heard of, of vehicles traveling that road now. So there's just a lot more um, vehicles noise and construction and just blow ups and and there was some large fires sometimes too. So um Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries program, they've been doing all the monitoring since we partnered with them initially. And um so um I'll let them speak more to that later. But uh, I do know that the birds there have been fewer of our target species nesting near the launch site. Okay, great. Next question is from Liz. How might birds fail at nesting? Like the black skimmer where they go to the beach instead? So, um, a lot of times, um, high tides will completely wash the eggs away sometimes. And the chicks, if the chicks are young, if they cannot fly, they can't really um, help themselves. So, a lot of times they'll get washed away. Um, coyotes literally will just walk through there and will just pick up eggs along their way, um, and even humans. So if a human, a beachgoer is walking on the beach and just stops, if they're on the beach run or wherever, they just stop, hang out, set their towel really close to a dune, and they don't recognize the signs that a bird is trying to tell them to go away. If they don't see or hear the bird screaming at them, snowy plovers, they'll do a broken wing to try to get you away from their nest. A lot of times people don't see that. So if, if the bird, the adult is off their nest, for sometimes um, over 10 to 15 minutes in the heat of the summer, that sun will actually kill the eggs. Um, the temperature is called, is a huge issue. So keeping the adults off that nest when they're disturbed um, is, is really dangerous. And so um, ghost crabs will swoop in and get those eggs when those adults are off their nest. Lots of, lots of things. And, you know, I will say to, um, to people's defense that a lot of, a lot of the issues are nature um, nature related. So weather or um, natural predators, there's um, a lot fewer disturbances we're seeing from humans, but I don't know if it's because hum the birds have just gone away from those areas that are high high use um, or our conservation have, measures have really worked on some of the other sites. So lots of different things going on. Okay, great. Julie asks, have I have seen some Wilson's plovers around our retention pond in Needville. Uh, let's see, Needville's in Fort Bend County, southern Fort Bend County. Do do Wilson's plovers nest in Needville? I did notice they migrated during the summer, and I'm recently seeing them again. Hmm. So Needville, that's in freshwater, right? Yep. Yeah. So, to my knowledge, no, I don't think they do. Um, Wilson's plovers like their favorite food is fiddler crabs and um, they will eat insects as well. So maybe if if um, for some reason or another they uh, were attracted to that area. But from my knowledge, I don't re recall any of them nesting any further north away from any kind of salt areas. Yeah, and if Julie, I would question that sighting that identification rather those might be killdeer or uh, something else. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Okay, next question is from Barbara. Is it safe to move the eggs to a safer area? No, it's not. One, we're not allowed to touch any of the eggs um, or, you know, harass them. But um, um, it it's also um, based on other literature, you know, they just, they won't, they won't, um, once they know it's their nest, it's their nest in that location. It is, it is there to stay. So um, no, we can't we can't move them. It's hard to watch because there's a lot of nests I would love to move. Like if you just move it, you know, three inches further away. But um, no. Okay. Next is a comment from Donna. She says, "Great presentation, Kristen. 
Uh, next question is from Britt. Is there any progress on limiting driving on the beach? No, um, no, and each beach is so different like Galveston beaches. Um, there's only little areas that you can basically park except for maybe San Luis Pass County Park. That's about the longest stretch of beach. I know that you can actually just drive along the beachfront, but so everything's different. Um, some of the. There's been talks of some beaches of, of incorporating um, parking passes or, you know, a parking permit, I should say. So to, you know, help um, help with that. But I haven't heard of any of the beaches change, um, to, yeah, suggest any changes to the vehicles. If anything, we're trying to put up bollards. Actually, that's that's one way we're trying to work with managers is to install wooden bollards to prevent vehicles from driving into those flats. So that is one effort we are um, working towards. Our, our partners are as well. Yep, and you mentioned in your talk about the Open Beaches Act, which began in the 1950s um, that we have to battle with. So everybody gets the right to drive their car on a Texas beach, go to other parts of the country and good luck. <laughs> yeah. um, Lisa says, thanks, good information. Um, next question is, from Angie, are there any monitoring events open to the public that might come up in the future? Monitoring, um, if anything, it's just like a, a one day kind of a thing. So for our monitoring efforts, we like to um, have fewer people on the beach. It's it's less stressful for the birds. And um, but we do um, have volunteers help with banding efforts. So that would be just a one day event. So that's that's one thing that we um, Help we do, um, you know, allow the public to come out with us to kind of see what we're doing and just sometimes holding that bird in your hand and feeling that heartbeat really can connect you to the bird. So we do um, occasionally um, have volunteers come out with us. So that would be if, um, uh, you know, if, if it's near some of our partners that are working out on the field. So. So if people want to help in the form of beach cleanup and, and there's that adds a lot of people to the beach. So timing could be important, right? Doing that in the non breeding season. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so like uh, with the Texas uh, GLO's adopt a beach program, they'll do some of it in the spring. They'll do those cleanups and when birds are already on their nest, but we try to um, work with those coordinators to try to avoid some of those important areas. Like there's a cleanup around Bolivar Flats, Schwabert Sanctuary, but they do the cleanup outside of, of the prime nesting area. So, um, yeah, timing is key for sure. <laughs> okay, looks like the last question is uh, from Britt. Is is there a cooperative effort with protecting turtle nests? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean. Uh, I know there's a lot of turtle monitors all across the coast, and so I know, I, you know, since I work in the Galveston region, I work closely with our turtle, um, the Turtle Island Restoration Network that does all the monitoring in the Galveston region. So we work closely. They, they know, they tell their volunteers to to keep out and and um, the signs. So we have done some coordination, and so um, I know there's other monitors across the coast, and we can um, there are definitely flyers that we could hand out to them as well. <laughs> 